Thank you for all of you jumping on here for tonight's best webinar. I am Amy Carney. I am uh, the Deputy Director for BEST. And we just wanna thank you so much for tuning in tonight to learn and educate yourself uh, during this awesome series that we're in the middle of um, on parents exposing the culture wars in the classroom. So tonight we are going to discuss a super important topic of Title IX and safety in our schools. So tonight I'm excited to introduce you to our uh, expert panelists, Alicia Brand and Dr. Antonio Campbell. And we will uh, hear from them and they're gonna tell us about the various changes um, that the radical liberals are making to Title IX uh, interpretations and how that's affecting our child's classroom uh, from K through 12 straight on through college. So uh, tonight we are joined by first uh, Alicia Brand. She is the co-founder of armyofparents.org. She's a mom of three and lives in Loudoun County, Virginia. Uh, Alicia serves as an advocate and spokesperson for students and families who have experienced sexual assault in school. She's committed to protecting children and fighting for rigorous education, free of political ideologies and agendas in the classroom, as well as student safety, parental rights, academic transparency, and individual freedom for all families. Dr. Antonio Tony Campbell serves on the faculty in the Department of Political Science at Towson University, teaching political theory, American national government, religion, and politics, and a survey course on presidential elections. Tony also served in the United States Army as a chaplain in the Maryland Army National Guard. He is also a dad of two, an author, and has been very involved in Maryland's political arena and was the state's rep uh, Republican nominee for United States Senate for the 2018 election cycle. He's also served on numerous educational boards and commissions. So welcome to you both. Thank you so much for taking time out for our best community. Um, we thank you for being with us. And just for all of you tuning in, we just wanna let you know that we will have some time at the end um, to answer questions that, that arise you know, through our conversation. And, and so we just ask if you can try and refrain um, from posting all those questions right away, but it, we will um, ask you to put them in the Q and A uh, function uh, at the bottom. And we will try to get to as many of those as we can uh, once our presentations are over. So, um, Okay, most of us have heard about Title IX, right? Mostly, I think, in regards to girls' sports uh, is, is a lot of what we know about it. But we may not understand exactly the changes that have happened in the last dec decade or so. So we're gonna start with uh, you, Alicia, and we are hoping that, can you help us understand what Title IX is exactly and what we need to be looking out for as parents uh, with kids in K through 12 schools uh, to keep our classrooms and our schools uh, and our students safer? Well, that is my hope that by the time I'm done speaking that everyone will have a better understanding of what Title IX is and what to do if, God forbid, you or someone you know is a victim of se sexual assault in schools. So I will share my screen now, so just bear with me for one second. Sorry, we just had it all keyed up, but it didn't quite work. Okay. There we go. Are you able to see? Yes, we're able to see, so I think. Let me just, uh, just a little bit frozen here. <laughs> you gotta love technology. I gotta love it. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you so much. 
Um, Amy, for that great introduction. I see that a lot of people have joined since you gave that introduction. So very quickly, I'll just tell you that my name is Alicia Brand. I am the president and co-founder of Army of Parents, and you can find us at armyofparents.org. We are headquartered in Loudoun County, Virginia, and we started out where we were just fighting for parental rights, um, and then we moved to, to uh, freedom and excellence in education, but now we're really committed to being advocates for parents and students who have suffered through sexual assault in their schools. Alicia, uh, can I bother you quick? Do you have, do you see something on your screen? Because um, can you click that off where it's, it's, it's blocking? Yes, I do see that. Perfect. We want to see your slides. So perfect. Thank you very much. I'm sorry about that. Okay. So I'm not a lawyer, so let me tell you how I got involved in helping students and parents through the most difficult times of their life. It all started for me on May 28th of 2021. I don't know if you all have heard of the Smith case in Loudoun County, but it made international news. This is when uh, the Smith daughter, I will call her, was anally raped and forced to perform oral sex by a boy who claimed to be gender fluid. Now, this boy, he was transferred to another high school down the road um, from that high school where he then moved on to another female victim and he sexually battered her within the um, first week of his school. Now, through FOIAs, and FOIAs are so valuable for almost everything that you do with the schools are really important. We learned that not only had Loudoun County Public Schools not filed a Title IX report, but they hadn't filed any Title IX for the many assaults that our school district had in at least five years. So... On June 22nd, we saw the father of the victim, which you can see up in the right, his name is Scott Smith. Um, he showed up at a school board meeting um, on June 22nd of 2021, which was almost an entire month after the incident, where they were discussing a transgender policy. He was verbally attacked by an activist, and when he yelled back at her, he was arrested. Now, keep in mind that not many people knew about what had happened to his daughter at this point, but this activist did, and she was, uh, and she was afraid that he was going to disrupt the vote on the transgender policy. So that's why this became really important. So he was removed um, by the police. So at the same time that this was going on, you can see this crazy person in the bottom right of your of your quarter um, of the of the graphic and that deranged looking individual. Well, that's me. I'm actually singing the national anthem in an effort to calm a very heated room full of angry parents who are upset because the school board had just walked out. It had nothing to do with Scott Smith, you see. It had to do with us not following through on the transgender um, agenda. We had questions. We had questions and we wanted to know what a safety policy um, would look like that would be married to any kind of transgender bathroom policy. And that question actually actually was, was never ever answered. So this is where my life becomes intertwined with the Smiths and my direction was forever changed. You see, Scott Smith was labeled a white supremacist, a racist, a domestic terrorist, and his picture graced the cover of every paper, online outlet, and TV station internationally. And that insane picture of me was right next to his. And I was captioned as an angry mom, and I earned the title of a domestic terrorist. And I wear that badge very, very proudly. Now, if they were referring to my horrible singing voice as a domestic terrorist, they'd be 100% right, but they weren't. They were referring to me as a parent who is advocating for my child. At this point, as I mentioned before, it was only known by a few that he was actually not a deranged, crazy white supremacist, but he was actually a wounded papa bear who was defending his baby cub. 
So soon after that meeting, I became the, the Smith's PR representative, their media spokesperson, and their advocate for everything, including Title IX. And at that point, I knew nothing about Title IX, and I wish I had. So my goal and the way that my life has changed was to help other parents know what to do in the event of a rape or if one of their friend's children were raped. We all have to take responsibility because we're a community and we all have to work together. So going back to June 22nd, when the school board returned, they returned to an empty room because they had us removed by police force, declaring it an unlawful assembly. Maybe you saw the coverage on the news, but that also went international. But later in that meeting, the board returned to discuss that transgender policy. And one board member who is now no longer on the board, she was a subject of the recall and she did resign shortly after the recall and after the board was found to be covering up this heinous crime, she asked the superintendent and each member if, if they knew of any students who were, who were ever sexually assaulted in any Loudoun County public restroom. And one by one, beginning with the superintendent and ending with the seventh school board member, they each said, guess what? They said, no, have no idea. Now through FOIAs, again, we learned that not only did the superintendent happen to know about this, but he sent an email to each one of the school board members and some of them, they even responded. So they all knew and they all covered it up. Why did they do that? They did that to pass a transgender policy. Again, they were discounting biological women. So due to bad decisions, bad policies, and lack of transparency, they will face a trial by international media. Massive lawsuits are coming that way, their way, including Title IX um, lawsuits, and, in and a promised investigation by our Attorney General, Jason Mieras. So you're probably thinking, well, that happened in Loudoun County. That won't happen in my district. Well, I'm here to tell you today, as an advocate, I'm getting calls from all over the country. Sex-based harassment is prevalent in our nation's K through 12 schools. But before we talk about how prevalent it is, we have to define what sex-based harassment is. Sexual harassment is any unwanted sexual conduct it encompasses jokes and comments and texts all the way to sexual assault. What is sexual assault? Sexual assault is unwanted sexual content, anything from kissing to rape. And stalking is now included in sexual harassment. So the ACLU has put together some behaviors that they deem that constitutes sex-based harassment. Some of them are very obvious. So I'm just going to tell you of one and then I'm going to tell you a personal story. So making anti-gay jokes is now considered sexual harassment. So that is really important for you to share with any teachers you know, important to share with any students you know. You may think that this is obvious, but it isn't. Kids say things all the time and they need to know that they could be charged with sexual harassment. And this is now very, very serious because it carries the full weight of the law. So let me tell you a true life story. My daughter's 14 years old and she's in middle school and she came home not too long ago. This wasn't even a month ago. And she came home to tell me that a boy was saying to his friends in the hallways of school and on Instagram, she slid into his DM and um, on other social media platforms like Snapchat that he wanted to F her. Well, you know, I had to sit her down and say, we do not 
as women or as men stand for this kind of behavior. And this is sexual harassment. And this can constitute a very big price for this child to pay. So it's also up to you before we go that route to stand up for yourself and say, no, I will not accept this. And also as a mother of two boys, I just sit my boys down and say, this is not funny. I also have a 14 year old boy and 11 year old boy and said, this is not funny. And you could be in big trouble. Should you say any words like this about any girl or any boy, we don't speak this way. So this is definitely a cautionary tale to think about with your children because the price is definitely high. So let's get a little bit quickly into the numbers. Um, giving credit to the Associated Press, they did engage in a project of tracking student on student sexual assault in elementary and secondary aged um, secondary schools. And they used da data that the FBI actually collected. And, and this, um, this data came from offenses that happened on school grounds. One third of our entire nation's law enforcement participated, but not the biggest um, cities. So that means that we need to use these numbers directionally, and you should know that these numbers are grossly underreported. So like assaults being underreported to police and by police, the media also underreports student on student assaults to us. But we do often hear of teachers sexually assaulting students. But did you know that for every teacher on student sexual assault, there are seven student on student sexual assaults. And there were 3,300 victims in, the, in 2013, 2014. And of those 3,300 victims of sexual assault, 20% were raped vaginally, anally, or penetrated with a foreign object. Now, you might be thinking, well, what is that? That's close to 700. When you have almost 51 million kids, what's the big deal? It's a big deal. You have to keep in mind that we send our kids to school thinking that they are going to walk through the schoolhouse doors and that they are going to be kept safe. If 700 kindergartners through high school age students, which is 17 or 18, I was 16 when I graduated from high school, are raped, 700 is an insane amount. And remember that these numbers are grossly underreported. So, so this is this is a terrible problem and it's not getting better, it's getting worse. If we move forward two and four years to 2015 and 2016 and 2017 and 2018, what we see is a dramatic growth in the increase in sexual assault of public school students. Now, we don't have 3,300 anymore. We have 15,000 students who experience sexual assault in our nation's public schools. You wanna talk about a systemic problem? I would say that this is a systemic problem. So where are we getting these numbers? We're getting these numbers from a pretty darn good source from the Civil Rights Office of the Department of, of Education. And what they do is they do a massive survey and they, they aggregate all of this information that they collected from nearly 18,000 school districts, 98,000 schools and 51,000 um, uh, million students. But again, these numbers are so grossly underreported. Why? Because as we saw in Loudoun County, our schools have an agenda. Their biggest agenda is to pass these transgender policies without input from the public. Yes, you'll have school board meetings. Well, you'll have public comments, but your comments don't matter. This is a, an agenda that's being driven from the federal government. Um, and also, if the schools do not 
comply with Title IX, they will lose funding. So they are not reporting this and they do not want to have this affect their school ranking for safety. So this is all being hit, hidden from us. This expansive growth in these numbers, however, should alarm every single parent on this call. And you need to tell all of your friends because we need to get involved. These numbers caused such a fear in the Trump administration that Betsy DeVos, who at the time was the education secretary, she stood up and she took notice. So what is this Title IX that we speak of? Please notice the graphic I'm using and you can see a girl with her helmet and a boy, I believe that is a badminton. <coughs> The Title IX educational amendments, they're not new. They started in 1972, and they were written to ensure that girls had a fair and equal access to education and that they could compete fairly in sports at federally funded institutions. Now, I know where your mind is going because that is not what this looks like anymore, right? So just stick with me for a little while because we are going to get to this. I want to talk about how Title IX changed through the administration. Now, it did change a bit before Obama, but Obama made very, um, President Obama made very significant changes to Title IX. He revised the existing rules. He sent the now famous Dear Colleague letter to every single school, and that letter told the schools how to handle claims of sexual assault. This was the one good thing about this was that this was the first time that sexual harassment was made a civil rights issue, but he also expanded Title IX to cover transgender students. This strips biological girls of the rights that Title IX was created to protect. His rules were a guidance. They were not a law but his rules made it much easier to prosecute perpetrators without due process by stripping away hearings and turning schools basically into kangaroo courts. So now we have President Trump. And in May of 2020, President Trump revised the Title IX rules and they went into effect all all schools had to apply, um, had to comply by August of 2020. Now, the, these rules were changed in an effort to protect victims and biological women while bringing back due process for perpetrators. His were not guidance, but they were rules that, as I said before, they carried the full weight of the law. His definition of sexual harassment was made much narrower, narrower simply by changing just one single word. And what that word was, was two. And he changed from two to and. Now, some people did not like this because some say this makes it much harder to prosecute perpetrators. It changes the definition of what is considered sexual, sexual harassment. So it went from you had to do A, B, or C for this to equal sexual, sexual harassment. Now it says you have to do A, B, and C for this to equal sexual harassment. So it's harder to prosecute perpetrators. Some also say that the change back to hearings re-victimizes victims. What, I'd like to give you um, another real life example. So you can see how we, most, we must protect both our boys and our girls from Title IX policies they, that may not protect either. Now, I have to say, I really believe that the best of intentions were here, but when they played out, we had some in unintended consequences. So there was a young girl in Prince William County um, in Virginia, and she went on a school trip, and they went to a planetarium. And when the lights went out, the boy's hand fell between her legs. That's what he said. He said his hand fell 
between her legs. Well, she was so traumatized that she called her father and they went to the school together and they filed a formal complaint and Title IX was initiated initiated. This victim had to tell her story so many times that she began to suffer from PTSD. The perpetrator's parents had money and they were able to get a lawyer. The victim's parents, they did not have money. They could not get a lawyer. And unfortunately, this poor child was forced to tell her story so many more times and answer questions that she couldn't possibly answer. The parents were so overwhelmed that both parent and child were further victimized through the process that now was taking place in the schools. So the schools were doing the hearings. These were not in the courts of law. So they were so traumatized that they pulled out and this perpetrator who actually did do this, he went free and everything was dropped. Now I'm gonna share a personal story with you that just happened. And this is the other side of the coin. I have an 11 year old son, as I, as I had told you. And his best friend since kindergarten said to him, I have a knot in the back of my shoulder. Can you help me work it out? I can't even move my arms. So my son who is best friends with him said, well, of course I can. And he went in and used his knuckle to work out the knot in the back of his friend since kindergarten's shoulder. Well, the principal saw this and she grabs my son brings him to the office and tells him that he is touching another child inappropriately. She grabbed my son's friend, took him to the nurse and gave him a lecture about how he needs to respect his body and, and conduct it with dignity. Now, I was not happy when my son came home and told me this, as you can imagine. I listened, I asked questions, I called the other child and the other child's parents. They both had the same exact story. When I spoke with the principal, I asked her to tell me what she saw. And she told me the same exact story that both of these boys told me. And I said, did you ask these boys why they were doing what they were doing? Because using the words touching inappropriately means sexual assault. And if this is a sexual assault, then my child deserves due process. And if he's going to have due pro process, then we are going to call for Title IX. And we are going to have lawyers and cross-examination. Now, is this what you meant by inappropriate touching? And she said, no, ma'am. No, I don't. And I'm really sorry. And I will apologize to your son and his friend tomorrow. And that is exactly what he did. But let me tell you something. If I did not know what Title IX was and everything that went along with it, and if I could not advocate for my son, this could have been on his record. So this is very scary. We need to protect our boys and our girls. And I hope that this story that I'm sharing with you that he will probably kill me for sharing, but it's so important. I really feel like I, I, just, I just had to share this with you. So as Betsy DeVos said, the federal, she's the federal secretary, she was the federal secretary of education under Trump. No parent should have to think twice about sending their child um, to school and that their safety has to be a concern. And I'm paraphrasing what she said um, while at school. To that end, the Trump administration added new rules and school accountabilities that you need to familiar yourself with because they strength, strengthen the protection against violence in schools. The most important rule to know, um, you don't have to be a victim to make a report. You can tell you can tell any school employee and they must act. There must be a trained and designated Title IX coordinator who responds within 24 
hours. And your child, if sexually um, harassed, they may qualify for services free of charge. There's others in here, and I suggest that you do go back and you and you look through them because they are really, really important to know. And further, under these Trump rules, further schools will be held accountable, and non-compliance will carry the full weight of the law. So what? What should you do should your child become a victim? The first thing that you need to do, and I did this with my kids after I experienced this, the Smith case. And then after I'm also advocating, because boys can be sexually harassed too. I had some middle school boys who were um, sexually assaulted by another boy. So it's important to have these conversations with your boys and with your girls for both sides. The, so have the conversation. Tell them in advance that if anything ever happens, they need to call you. They all have their cell phones on them. They need to go to the bathroom. They need to call you immediately. They should never, ever write anything down. I have seen children write things down, and what they write isn't exactly what happened because they were scared. They were nervous. They didn't want to get the other any other students in trouble, and this was used against them. So you do not want them to write anything anything down, I cannot stress that enough. You want to call the police because you don't know if the school will. In the Smith case, they did not call the police. What they ended up doing was calling the police on Mr. Smith because he uh, went into a rage because there was no ambulance there. There was no, there were no police cars there. They called the police on him, but not on a rapist, a serial rapist. Um, so, um, document everything by recording it. Please check your, your state laws. If it is a one person state law, you can record without asking anyone. Make sure that your school resource, resource officer, also known as an SRO, is sending a report to juvenile intake. I've seen it happen several times where they didn't send the report to juvenile intake. And unfortunately, the report didn't get there. So follow up, go to juvenile intake, make sure that a report was, file, was filed and make sure that you follow up on every single email in writing. And very importantly, let out your inner mama and papa bear. We need, we need that grizzly. So does your child. And Alicia, I'm going to pop in here because we're going to need to switch over uh, to Dr. Campbell here in a minute. So I don't know if you want to um, kind of wrap this up. And then I think we can get this full presentation um, out to everyone and we can get back to some some of this and maybe at the end. So yes, please do follow up on this because the next couple of slides tell you what your options are. Um, uh, whether you go through the process in school and how to file a formal complaint or an informal complaint, um, whether you go through a criminal process or a civil process, how to get a protection order, and do you qualify for services? And then we talk about what's happening Oh, I don't know why it's not advancing, but what it's not advancing, but what um, we talk about Biden's executive order, and it's important that everyone um, fight back um, against the changes that are coming, because our biological women are being threatened, and we're not against the transgender students by any means, but we are pro women. I'm sorry I went over a little bit there. Please no, it's great. It's great information. And then I think if you can put your email um, or your website in the chat, so people, if they want more information too, they can reach out to you. That would be amazing. Absolutely. And, and then I will you, stop sharing. Okay. Thank you so much for all of that. You are welcome. Yeah, there's so much we need to, to know and learn about this uh, Title IX. Um, so Dr. Campbell, you work at the college level. And you say that Title IX has been hijacked by the left uh, away from its intended purpose in higher education, which was to give women equal opportunities and educational programs, um, including collegiate sports. 
Right. Part of this uh, sub subversion is the use of language, which replaced biological sex with gender identity. And so I'm so excited for you to walk us through what you mean you know, by this. Yeah, so is that the, so I have a slide presentation. Here you go. Uh, <laughs> next slide. Um, so as Alicia mentioned before, this is the wording in, of Title IX in 1972. And I think the thing to keep in mind is in 1972, um, the law was written for a binary system, right, of, of men and women. And at the time, we're not just talking about sports, we're talking about other educational opportunities. And so as you read Title IX, we're dealing with everything from uh, law school admissions, grad school admissions, uh, women wanting to be doctors, uh, just the whole breadth and range of occupational um, education that women had a hard time trying to you know, get into these programs, especially in higher education. And so Title IX wasn't just written, I mean, it's been interpreted and added as far as sports is concerned, but, you know, the, the, the origination of this was how do we make sure that women are not discriminated in higher education and in the occupations that they want to receive. Now, the second, the last part of this um, paragraph is the tricky part as far as federal assistance because every university every college and most of most k-12 especially public k-12 institutions also receive federal funding and so that is one of the ways that we're going to discuss this in a few minutes uh as far as leverage that the national government actually has over local k-12 education next slide so in Doing research for tonight, um, words have meaning. And I want to look up the words that describe sex and gender. And this slide is Merriam Webster's dictionary. Go when you when we got this call, go on Google, look it up. And it says, quite frankly, under 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, it's about sex is about biology. Right. Uh, not only, I mean, you see 2A and 2B talking about, um, you know, motivated behavior and 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 actual uh, the act of, of having sex, but sex, the word sex is surrounded by the understanding that there are two sexes, that there is male and there's female. Um, and reproductive organs and all the things that are, are in this in this uh, definition. So I think it's important for us to keep that in mind that sex is biology. Okay, next slide. And looking at the word gender, however, and you all you, you can please you know just read through this and I'll kind of summarize this. Psychology today and the dictionary both looks at gender as a social construct. Now, the reason why I think this is important is because social construct, constructs change over time. They change over uh, information and how it's given and who gives the information and, and indoctrination and the things that we're concerned about as parents, that the more uh, a specific point of view is seen as the dominant point of view then that changes people's perceptions about what is acceptable and what isn't. And so one of the things that the left has done and they do all the time is word confusion. And to use words, uh, A, for, di for different meanings, and B, in this case, I think what they've done is, is a motivated, dedicated program to swap out the word sex for gender or the meaning sex for gender. And, and once that happens in society and once we have agreed to that, that is the norm, meaning uh, that that's acceptable, that gender then replaces sex, then all bets are off, right? Because then we have not argued 
the facts of the case. We were, we're accepting the facts after, you know, after the fact. And now, and now, you know, uh, some of us, a lot of us are kind of waking up. And I think one of the things that the pandemic did, quite frankly, and I, I'm sure Alicia will agree to this, is I think parents were asleep at the will until the pandemic happened. And then, you know, we're kind of waking up and we're saying, well, we're going through this virtual learning thing and we're trying and we're and we're trying to figure out what our kids are being taught in the classroom and that they're or not in the classroom, but virtual learning. And we're home with them all day because we're also sequestered inside our house. And then we're like, well, what are they teaching our kids? And so I think that the virtual learning kind of started this whole process of parents waking up and then. And now we're seeing this other information that that our that our students are actually uh, receiving as well. And it's not just about gender uh, and, and, and sex. And I'm going to circle back to this, too. But uh, equity and equality is the same thing. Right. Um, the left push out pushes out this idea of equity. And that's supposed to be equality. What those are two different things. And I explained to my college kids that, you know, equity is basically mandating C plus students. It's not about excellence. It's not about opportunity. It's not about succeeding. It's about mandating an outcome. And that's, you know, kind of what they're doing with, you know, the, and there's a summary here on the, on, the, on the screen here is, according to the dictionary, bi sex is biology, that there's male, female, and intersex. And gender, it's a social contract that can be changed based on personal wishes or changing of societal acceptance. So what, what we're facing here is a coordinated campaign from the left to change what is sex. And once that, once that happens, then Title IX, as we know it, is out the window um, because then it can mean anything, right? So I think there's... There's three ways. Next slide, please. So again, they do not mean the same thing. There's a uh, confusion between sex and gender as, as far as re redefining the social construct. And the last paragraph is the one I want you to read. Once we lose the battle over language, then the left moves from defense to offense. Instead of the question being, why should it be this way? Or why should, uh, why should, uh, again, this is not, I'm not taking a side. I don't, I'm not uh, speaking against transgender individuals and trans transgender people. I, that's not, that's not me. But what I'm saying is once we lose the battle over language, then we're on the defense. Right. Then the, then the left can say, well, why shouldn't it be this way as opposed to why should it be this way? So you've already lost the argument. So what we're doing at this point is, is playing defense and trying to explain why women should be protected under Title IX. Right. And, and, and that's what the left does. They, they do a very good job of switching the, the, the paradigm and, switch, and switching the narrative. And instead of us talking about what seems to be, what is the law, right? Because that's clearly written in the law. Instead, we're trying to justify protecting women because they've already changed the narrative. Next slide. Um, this is, I just want to play a couple minutes of this piece. Uh, this is uh, Stossel talking about uh, that Title IX actually hurts men and women the way that it's um the way that it's being um uh, what's the word uh implemented so please go ahead and play that not playing all right moving on <laughs> moving on so what I was going to show you was, so I'm at Towson University, and one of the things that Title IX has done uh, through uh, unintended consequences was basically caused the ending of male sports. Um, that it, it works 
as far as uh, it's a proportional system that if there's 50% women on campus, there needs to be opportunity for 50% women in sports. But what is done is to actually limit the amount of sports that men can play because of, because these schools have to follow these rules. And so what's happened here at my, my campus is that our, our baseball team and our soccer team were basically defunded, right? They were kicked out of campus. Um, so women who are given protection under Title IX are put in harm, in my belief, put in harm by the encroachment of better gender identities who choose to participate in women's sports. And, Titan, and Biden's EO is just going to make it even worse because of the money situation that we talked about earlier, that there is uh, money that, that uh, K-12 schools, public schools receive for uh, Title I money, which is for uh, folks that are uh, less able to, 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 basically people who are um, less fortunate, right? So the federal, the, the national government funds schools, and then they have this leverage over them as far as policy and curricula and those kind of things. But I, I do want to go one more slide, I think. No, okay. So there's some things that we can do. I, let's let's get to the let's cut to the chase here about what we can do. I think there are three things that uh, I know a lot of you are running for school board, and I think that's very important. So uh, one of the hats I wear is uh, I'm on this uh, school board nomination commission locally, and so. You know, there are people who apply, they go through an application process, we look at their applications and we try to pick the best people. But getting involved is being in a room, you know, uh, you know making your voices heard, that, that's, that's huge because local government is supposed to do three basic things, so provide services, but the most important thing they do is to educate your children. Yeah, there's infrastructure, there's public safety, and those things are important too, but it's the education of our children that is going to decide the, the future of this republic. And if we allow this to continue, then we're, we're not going to recognize this country, you know, two generations from now, right? Because that's their whole plan. So policy, local level, school boards, absolutely. The second thing is, you know, Alicia was talking about legally, right? Um, the left has used the courts for decades, and they've used it to push their agenda. And, you know, I was part of a, a congressional district court case here in Maryland, and, you know, we won. We actually kicked out a Democrat map. We actually were the first state in this country to kick out a Democrat-controlled legislature map for Congress. And, we, you know, and I was like yesterday. So legal cases do count. They do move the needle. They do right some wrongs. So if you find yourself in a position to, to do that, then, you know, go for it. You know, be that voice. You know, get involved that way. And I think the third thing is remember the Constitution. The national government cannot set curricular policy. It can't. It's, con it's, it's not able to because we have federalism. We have a national government in 50 states. And those 50 states are the ones that their governors and their legislatures are the ones that are constitutionally mandated to take care of the education, health, and welfare of the people. So remember federalism that it is the local government, I mean, it's the local jurisdiction, and it's the state governments that actually run the education systems in your state. It's not, you know, Biden can write all the executive orders as he wants, but we see in the Florida with, with the parental rights, with parental rights bill. Florida, if, that, if it doesn't want to take national money, the money from the national government, it doesn't have to. They'll find other ways of funding their schools. So we need to, we need to be upfront, you know, bold, Make sure you elect the right people people at the state level so you can keep your sovereignty. And that's all I got. Wow, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, do you see the Department of Education using Title IX to go after states like Florida that that you know pass are passing this parental rights bills like HB 1557? Yeah, I think they will, but I, I think that the, I say this to my, my conservative friends a lot, and look, I, there's some things about President Trump I don't, I don't like and I, I don't agree with, but thank God for his four years in office, because he put a lot of folks on the federal bench, and 
a lot of stuff is going to be civil rights cases. It's going to be, you know, equal protection, 14th Amendment stuff that this is going to come down to. And if we have, and, you know, and Trump having those four years and putting people on the bench, it's going to help us. You know, when it gets to that, that circuit level, I mean, the, you know, circuit level, regional level, appellate level, and his Supreme Court nominees, you know, you got a, you got a majority on that too. So I think there are avenues for states can keep their sovereignty. They'll have to go through the courts, but, you know, I, I think we're in better shape than we were. Without Tr Donald Trump four years, we'll be done. We would have been done. But, you know, sometimes God gives us the thing that we need, even though we don't like it exactly. <laughs> no, it's exactly true. I mean, I'm a mom of six who was busy and um, not paying attention and trusting, you know, our local officials and um, school administrators to be doing the right thing. And um, and so I'm alongside you. I'm grateful for the pandemic that woke me up and woke us up across the country. Um, and so, Alicia, what um, I know I learned from you talking to you earlier. Um, about what can you tell parents? What can they look for? What do they need to be looking for on the school, on their district website, right? Aren't they supposed to, um, can you tell us what is supposed to be listed? Where do they go on their district website to learn about Title IX in their, in their district? Very good question and thank you for asking it. It's really important to know that your school is required to have the Title IX coordinators contact information on the website as well as every bit of training material. If it's not there, they're in violation of Title IX and you can ask for it and you can um, say, you need to send this to me and they must. And if, and if they don't, then contact the Office of Civil Rights because you are entitled to this information. I saw that um, somebody had said in, in the uh, chat that their child was being sexually harassed at school and they reported it and the school said that they would get back to them. They're in violation of Title IX if they don't, if you make a report and you make a complaint and you say it's a formal complaint, they must get back to you in 24 hours. Otherwise they're in violation. Start being tough. Don't be afraid. Never be, I started out afraid. I didn't want anybody to know my real last name. When I talked to school board meetings, I used my first name. I still don't use my married last name because I'm protecting the innocent uh, because I have a lot of people coming at me with um, school board recalls, but don't, you can't be afraid. Once you start going out there and you saying, I will not accept this for my child, you will start becoming braver than you ever knew you could be. Yeah. And I think it's so important to educate yourself, which is the whole point of um, BEST and their resources in this webinar series, right? Is that yeah. we take the time um, to educate one another um, on, on, on these important topics because we need to educate ourselves now. So if we get in that situation, we know what to do, right? And then we know how to handle it. And it's, the, and your story about your son is proof of that. You were able to come back and recite, you know, law to, and then they're like, whoa, 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 they're, and, you know, and I find this on, on all, all levels that if, if we can recite the law to them and they see we're educated, they, that they back away, right? They, they, they comply. And so we can't be afraid um, to stand up for our rights as parents um, and as you know, community members. And I'm so. seeing so many people putting into the chat that their that their child was hurt, and I'm I'm just you know like beside myself about it. Um, you you need to get a lawyer and sue them for Title IX. I don't know what state you live in, but call your um, attorney general. And tell them they're in violation of Title IX. I mean, it's just not okay. It's not acceptable. Stand up and fight. You don't need to threaten. You need to do. And I'm here to help you if you need it. Contact me at armyofparents at gmail.com. And you can also go to my website at armyofparents.org. Right. And, and I think the people need to know that they're not alone, right? That's not what alone. I think you could take uh, from tonight's presentation, too, is is if your your child has experienced something like this or will in the future, you are not alone, and um, we are banded together, uh, you know, across this beautiful country of ours. And so there's support uh, in in uh, you know best and what we're doing together. And so um, if we have any questions in the Q and A, I'm not uh, 
seeing too much. Where do we find the Title uh, IX information on the board sites, right? You probably just need to Google that. Add on the school board. So Google your school district. So mine would be Loudoun County Public Schools. I'd say Loudoun County Public Schools Title IX, and it'll take you to your school district and it'll be on there. If it is not on your particular school site, that's a violation of Title IX and it has to be prominently displayed. Right, okay. And Dr. Campbell, I wanna ask you uh, a question here um, that we received earlier on how do we guard against, you know, these bad, these negative changes to Title IX? How, how do we prevent federal overreach? Um, well, I think part of it is that we have to remember what the role of the government is. And I think that unfortunately our, our civics education has really suffered over the last, you know, 30, 40 years. You know, take the take the pandemic. I, I'm probably gonna go around to Mulberry Bush to answer your question, Amy, but yeah, we just basically accepted local government, especially in Maryland, we like we accepted local government shutting down businesses. Right. And basically dictating to people what their lives and livelihood was going to be for about a year and a half now. And if the founding fathers would have had that same choice, they probably would have picked up their muskets. Because they knew what the limit of government was supposed to be. And to, so to circle back around and, 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 and answer your question, we got to know our, what our government is supposed to do and what the limits of the government are. And. It should never be about giving the government the power to then hurt us or to hurt our children. And, you know, when we do that, then we give up our sovereignty. We give up, we give up our citizenship. We're just basically, uh, what's the word, uh, uh, servants. You know, we, we're we give our money and then the money that we give to the government, then it's used to hurt us and our children. What kind of insanity is that? You know, so yeah. that's what we need to do, Amy, we, you know, just to kind of recover our, recover our, our, our freedom and our, and our liberty, you know, understand what the role of government is and the limit of government. And so the last thing I'll say, higher education is part of this too, because, you know, these teacher education programs, they're just turning out uh, young people who are indoctrinated, just like they're trying to indoctrinate our children. And you know, we need to be uh, well, cognizant of both sides of the equation. The, the teachers that are that are been brainwashed to teach the stuff that they're doing, including CRT and gender re-education and all that stuff, and make sure that our kids don't fall for it. And, and you know, I have an eight-year-old daughter. Boy, you know, <laughs> woo. Do you have her in public God school? God bless you all. <laughs> Do you have her in public school? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good because you're paying attention and you're educated and you know what to look for and, and stand up for. So um, I so appreciate you taking the time to educate us and to be with us, be a support to our best community um, all the way there in, in Maryland. I'm in Arizona and, uh, and Alicia in Virginia. And I'm just so thankful um, for you all taking the time uh, to, to educate myself and our community because it's so important and it's so the the reminder it's so important that we do courageously stand up for our rights right um and we've learned that and so um, i just want to 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 thank everyone um for being on this tonight and for um best putting together this this webinar series um if you have been following along then um you know that we've got one more coming you can go to parentsknowbest.com and you can find out uh, that our, our upcoming schedule for webinars. You can see different call, coalition calls you can jump on. Um, and we've got our excellent school board candidate academy, which uh, if you are considering running or if you are running, um, please sign up for that. It is a weekly live training on Tuesday mornings. And if you haven't uh, experienced that, you may want to do that. Even if you have no intention of running. It's just another way to educate yourself, um, you know, on this this battle that we are in. So I just want to thank you so much, uh, Dr. Campbell and Alicia from ArmyOfParents.org for joining us tonight, and for all of you uh, parents and school board candidates, community members, for taking your time to jump on here tonight. 
and, uh, and you will be able to share this uh, webinar with friends and continue the conversation uh, offline. So thank you so much for all of you for joining me and we will hopefully see you soon. Thank you everyone. Thanks.